Uh, there's going to be a heavy emphasis on distributed sensing because in distributed sensing, you use cable and NCAB makes cable. And I'm a cable guy for a long, for a long time before I even worked in fiber optic, uh, fiber optic cables myself. I was working with conductors and uh, other utility cables. So I'm a cable guy. So of course, distributed sensing is very much of interest to me. Uh, we'll talk about the things that you can use the sensing for. And then we'll talk about how to put together a good uh, fiber optic sensing system. And I want to emphasize this is uh, fiber optics 101. So this is going to be like a primer, uh, an introductory presentation about what can be done. We're not going to go detail into the nuts and bolts of it. I want you to understand the concepts of how it works and how it might be useful to you. And I'm intentionally trying to stimulate thought you know, at your utility, for those of you that work for utilities, how might you use fiber optic sensing to enhance the reliability of your uh, transmission grid? That's my goal today. So here are the rules for this. So we've already done the in introduction, and if you've already heard me, then uh, we've complete, successfully passed the sound check. Um, this one is a little longer than I would like to be. I prefer to keep them to about an hour. This one's going to run an hour and a half just because there's a lot of material. Maybe I should have broken it down. We'll see. Uh, you can use the chat for questions during the presentation. I won't be responding to them, though. Um, it, it just kind of uh, interrupts the flow, so to speak. But we will have a live question and answer session at the end. We do ask that questions, whether submitted through chat or through the live Q&A at the end, be technical questions only. So if you've got an order in progress or business in progress with NCAB, we don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. We want to talk about stuff that's on target here. So let's get started. Why use fiber optic cable systems, fiber optic cable sensors? Uh, First reason, intrinsically safe, right? There's nothing moving, um, and so uh, they're completely safe. They're inert, you might say. Uh, very sensitive, so the things that they can sense, they do quite well. You've got a wide band bandwidth, so you can get not just sensitive data, but quite a lot of it. They're passive when you're using distributed uh, fiber optic sensors specifically. Uh, you don't have to power them. So if you're using a distributed system to sense uh, temperature over 10 miles, you don't have to have electric power over that whole 10 miles. Now, you, obviously, you do have to have power uh, at the beginning where you're generating the laser and where you've got your uh, the sensing equipment that actually detects the, the signal and processes it. But uh, throughout that 10 miles of cable, you don't have to have any additional power. You've got integrated communication. So the fiber itself is not only the sensor, it's also its own data link. And because of that, you may already be able to do to implement various types of fiber optic sensing in cables that you already have installed or that you're planning to install uh, in the near future. Fiber optic sensors are immune to electromagnetic interference. They're small and lightweight. And in general, they're non-metallic, so you don't have galvanic issues like you do with some types of um, sensors that you might put uh, underground. Uh, but of course, if you end up using an armored cable, well, that's a different story, you know, a metallic armored cable. But um, yeah, I probably should update that a little bit. Moving on. So fiber optic sensors work uh, for the most part on backscatter and so i want to spend a little time to tell you what's going on with backscatter so that way you'll understand the concept of how they work and what can do what and why so the backscatter is basically the reflection of light as it travels down a fiber so what you see in the illustration here you have the laser input and you have the laser output but along the way the light gets scattered. And that can be from either 
the photons of the light hitting particles, so mo molecules that make up the fiber, and that's called Rayleigh or Raman scattering. Uh, or it can be an interaction, a complex interaction with the light and the electromagnetic field of the light with the material waves in the fiber or the structure of the fiber itself. And that's a lot harder to draw. You can illustrate the first type of reflection where photons are actually hitting something. That's easy to illustrate, like you see here. Again, the light goes in, uh, it hits a molecule that's comprising the optical fiber, and then it bounces around. It gets scattered, hence the name backscatter. So there are two characteristics of that backscatter. One is that it can be elastic, which means that the total kinetic energy is unchanged. It's just the direction of the photon has been changed, but the kinetic energy remains the same. And that's what you see in Rayleigh scattering. Or it can be inelastic. And that means that some of the kinetic energy appears to be lost, but because of conservation of energy, we know it's not truly lost. It's actually just been transformed. That could be heat, but really in optical fiber, it's more likely and more useful if it's a change in wavelength, which because wavelength and frequency are inversely related uh, by the speed of light, um, you get a change in wavelength or frequency, and you can use the change in wavelength or the frequency, whichever is more convenient for you. And you see that uh, Raman and Brion scattering are in that inelastic category. So we'll talk about the three types of backscatter. So Rayleigh is first. I already said that's an elastic scattering, and it's because you've got the photons hitting a particle. Now, some uh, could just continue forward. Some will go back. And consequently, this is the source of your attenuation in your fiber. Attenuation, you'll recall, is loss of power. So at the beginning of a fiber, I inject a certain amount of fiber, uh, power. At the end of the fiber, I get less power out. Well, that's because of the Rayleigh scattering. And that scattering, the, the reason for, uh, or the way that's useful is that the scattering that goes back means that pa some power was lost going forward. So that's the source of your attenuation. But the fact that you have power going back means that you can detect that and then you can analyze how much loss you got. And that's the basis of how OTDRs work. Uh, Rayleigh scattering is not affected by changes in temperature or strain that's on the fiber. And we'll see why that's important in a few slides from now. Raman scattering is also called the Raman effect. And I said already that's inelastic. So you're getting a change in frequency or wavelength uh, as part of this form of scattering. And the scattered photons likely lose energy uh, and in something that I have to admit I don't fully understand. They could also gain energy. So you have stoke shifts and anti-stoke shifts. And because of that, you get this change in frequency as well. And I already mentioned frequency and wavelength are inversely related. So if you know one, you know the other as well. The molecule of the fiber is affected in the opposite way. So if the photon gained energy, then the molecule is losing energy. If the photon lost energy, then the molecule is gaining energy. The Raman effect it varies significantly with changes in temperature of the fiber. And because of that, we can use it for detecting changes in temperature. Brion scattering is another form of inelastic scattering, and that's caused by interaction of the electromagnetic magnetic wave. So if you recall back to your physics classes, light is interesting because it has aspects or characteristics that are like particles, which is why we talk about it in terms of photons, but it also has aspects of it that are waves. 
And the Brion effect is that more of that wave effect of the electromagnetic uh, wave that comprises the light with the structure of the particles of the glass itself. And I have to say structure because glass is amorphous by its nature, so it's not really forming a, a cubic lattice like you see in many metals. So in Ramon, like in Ramon scattering with Brion scattering, there's both an exchange of energy and there's a change in the electromagnetic field of the light. And again, it can be a gain or loss of energy. And Brion scattering, no surprise, because it's related to the structure of the glass, it's no surprise really that anything that is going to affect the structure of the glass is going to affect the amount of Brion scattering that you get. So that can be temperature, right? Because when temperature changes, things tend to either expand or contract. Uh, with Brion scattering, that's true. So we can use it for temperature sensing. Uh, when you put tension on a fiber, you're putting the fiber under strain. That's changing the structure of the glass. So again, that's going to affect your Brion scattering. So you can pick it up and use it for strain sensing. Likewise, pressure, so an outside pressure on the fiber uh, will also be affecting its structure. And so again, um, we can use the Brion scattering. It's going to affect the Brion scattering, and so we can use it for detecting changes in pressure. Just wanted to visualize this. So if you're transmitting light around a certain wavelength, you know, of course, I could do it on frequency as well, but this illustration is based on wavelength. So your Rayleigh scattering, as you expect, is right at that wavelength. Uh, your Brion and Ramon scattering are shifted. And what you see here is an illustration that with Ramon's uh, scattering, the temp a temperature change causes the intensity, the amount of the Ramon scattering that you're getting to vary and you can detect this and therefore say what caused it and that's the basis of your sensing working. And likewise with Brion scattering, the changes affect it, but you see that it's changing the frequency. Excuse me, since I drew this as wavelength, I should say it's changing the wavelength, but again, um, wavelength and frequency are directly related or inversely related. So if you know one, you know the other. And then this graph is just based on temperature change. That's the only thing it's considering, not changes in um, pressure or changes in strain. So let's get an overview of how we can use these types of scattering. So Rayleigh, I already said, is not sensitive to changes in temperature. It is what it is. It's also not uh, affected by changes in strain. So at first you would think, well, I can use it for an OTR because I said already, um, because of its nature, it's the basis of how an OTR works. But it does turn out that if you're using some sophisticated um, uh, signal processing technology, you can use it for acoustic sensing as well. Ramon scattering, uh, you have a strong sensitivity to changes in uh, temperature. And I note here the anti-Stokes. So if we go back, notice it showed here as a change, but it doesn't show here as a change. So temperature is affecting Ramon on the Stokes components, just the anti-Stokes components. Uh, it's not, Ramon scattering is not sensitive to strain. So you end up, no surprise, it's best for being used to detect temperature. Brion scattering is very sensitive to temperature changes. We saw that in the previous slide. It's also very sensitive to changes in strain. And so as a consequence to that, you can use it for detecting temperature or strain, which in turn means that you can use it to detect um, pressure. And because you can detect pressure, that means you can also detect sound, right? Because sound waves, uh, hit the fiber, and that's the effect of a type of pressure on the fiber, and you can detect that. And we'll see how to use all of these in subsequent slides. So how can you actually apply 
backscatter for your sensing? Well, it turns out you've got three ways of doing that. First up is discrete sensors. A discrete sensor, you're using just one fiber optic sensor to sense backscatter at one point of a fiber. So you could also call this a point sensor if you wanted to. You can take a series of discrete sensors and you can put them together, use them in series, and you get a quasi-distributed fiber optic sensor. So basically, you're making an array of discrete sensors along a fiber. And then the one that's most interesting, because remember at the beginning I said I'm a cable guy, so uh, we like distributed sensors the best. Uh, in a fully distributed sensor, you're using the fiber itself as a linear continuous sensing element. And we'll talk about all of these. So discrete sensing uh, really means what's called a fiber brag grading. And that's been around for a long time. Um, it, it senses at a single point. It actually works. I know we've talked about backscatter, and I feel like this is a little bit of sort of a letdown to say this, but uh, uh, FGBs actually work on Fresnel reflection, which is where the light um, reflects and, refl and refracts at the interface between uh, the core and the cladding. So it's a little bit different than what we've been discussing but it is still sort of a form of backscatter. Uh, there are lots of applications for FGBs. Uh, they're commonly used beyond just sensing, I mean. They're commonly used in fiber optic multiplexers and demultiplexers. So you're juicing up your bandwidth by getting multiple signals across a fiber. And then at the other end, you've got to separate them all. So that's a multiplexer just allows you to combine a bunch of different uh, signals together and transmit them down a fiber and a demultiplexer lets you separate them back out so you can process them individually for the information they contain. Uh, they're also used in optical filters. So like in uh, fiber optic to the home projects, you're going to be using F, uh, FBGs. Oh, here, this is a mistake. Uh, you're going to be using uh, FBGs uh, to um, uh, separate the signal so that part of it can go to one house and another part of it can go to another house and so on. It's uh, kind of another form of multiplexing and demultiplexing. Um, you can get discrete temperature, pressure, and strain. FBG sensors are available, but again, they provide data for just a single point. Generally, they're installed in a permanent or a fixed installation. You're, you're not like moving them around or something. The quasi-distributed sensing option is basically take a bunch of FBGs and install them along a fiber. Now, maybe in theory, you could do hundreds or thousands. In reality, you can just do tens, you know, 10, 20, something like that. Um, you collect the data and you use that multiplexing uh, technology to uh, like aggregate the data and then separate it out again later uh, for individual processing. You can use a, a cover a long distance though if you're using a low loss fiber. The fully distributed sensing option, as I talked about before, you're using the fiber itself as the sensor. And so effectively, you've got thousands of sensors available to you. So if you were doing a 10 kilometer fiber run, you could you have effectively 10,000 sensors because your pulse of light is gonna be on the order of one meter. So that's cool. So that distributed sensing um, concept has been, uh, built into five different technologies that are used today, of which two are very commonly used by electric utilities. So we'll talk about all five, because some of them are, although they're not used much by utilities today, we'll see that they could be used by utility today. And again, that comes back to the concept earlier. I'm trying to give everybody a big picture overview of what you can do, um, not necessarily what's already being done but I'll talk about that too. 
So the five types, distributed temperature sensing, distributed acoustic sensing, meaning sound, distributed strain sensing, effectively tension, distributed temperature and strain sensing, and we'll talk about why these are, are talked about separately, and distributed pressure sensing. Of these, the first two, DTS and DAS, are by far the most common for electric utilities today. So distributed ten temperature sensing is up first. This is based on Raman uh, backscattering, typically, and you can go really long distances, depending upon the fiber type that you're using. So you can effectively cover a typical transmission line, no problem. Um, it's been around for a while. It's got an extensive track record. It's often used for reservoir and pipeline monitoring, and it can be used for fire detection. And I mean, it really is used in uh, buildings or in particular tunnels you see it often used for fire detection because um, in tunnels that are long distances, you know, a fire can be uh, quite dangerous and you need to know about it. Uh, and I, I want to point out that in ADSS or OPGW, it could be used as, for this fire detection role, right? We've all seen the news in the United States about all the wildfires out west in particular. And you could use existing cable today uh, to detect um, when the cable's getting hot. And that'll tell you that there's a fire. And that'll tell you that, you know, if somebody's not already on it, they darn well need to be quite quickly. And we'll talk about how you could even do more than that. We'll talk about that later. Um, with a, you know, an OBGW tends to be high on a structure and it's metal, so it's not vulnerable to the fire damage as much as say an ADSS is. But of course, nobody would like the idea of their ADSS if it caught on fire and just immediately failed. You can do fire rated ADSS cables that would give you uh, X amount of time, typically three hours. So you could get a three hour warning that uh, there's a fire in the immediate vicinity of a, of a line and make sure that resources to deal with that fire are being directed there as quickly as possible. Uh, and that would give you uh, the necessary time to rework your communication path because, okay, I know the, it's got the fire now, I've got three hours or whatever the flame rating is for that particular cable before it's going to fail. I need to deal uh, with rerouting my traffic. Uh, DTS is already used a lot by utilities, but not the way I just talked about in ADSS or OPGW. In instead, what you see is it's often used in high voltage underground power cable systems. Now, because in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, because of the cost of the technology, it was pretty much limited to 115 kV and above. And there were three ways that it could be done. But today, the cost of doing it has gone down a lot. So, you know, if you have an important 69 kV transmission line or even a sub transmission line, 35 kV or whatever, um, you know, you could be using DTS today to monitor the condition of those circuits. And you could do more, as we'll see in just a minute. But basically, the implementation of this is one of three ways. The two most common are to use a stainless steel tube embedded in the cable sheath. And that's very accurate for temperature and responsiveness, but it complicates uh, the splicing, both the electrical splicing, keeping the, the conductivity of the conductor part of the cable going, and the optical splicing that's required. And I don't like systems where the failure of one aspect of the system takes out the rest of the system. And so that's, a, to me, a significant disadvantage of this concept of bedding a stainless steel loose tube in the cable system is because if, I, if the optics fail, well, then I've lost that capability. So now I can't monitor the condition of my power cable anymore. Um, and the only way to fix that is to replace the entire cable, which th those tend to be expensive cables. 
but likewise, if the power cable fails, like there's um, you know tracking in the uh, in the insulation that leads to a failure, uh, well, that's going to blow your uh, communication system as well. So again, the only solution is to replace everything. So I not really a, a real big fan of this approach, but it 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 is done. What's more commonly done is to put a separate cable in the same duct bank. But here you're making a big sacrifice on accuracy and responsiveness uh, in order to improve the installation and uh, reliability of the system. But that's a big trade-off that you're making there. So is there another way? Well, yeah, I think so, the third way. Today, uh, there are lots of micro cable designs, uh, particularly for blowing in. And, um, you know, so potentially you could put a cable in with the power cable in the same duct and thereby get much better accuracy and responsiveness and much greater reliability as well. So to illustrate what I'm talking about here, so here's just a typical duct bank uh, installation. So here's your ground level, you've got uh, dirt, you've probably put thermal backfill below the dirt, and then here's your concrete with your ducts in it. So the embedded stainless steel loose tube concept, you would put the, the tube right in the, just underneath the outer jacket typically, or mixed with the, what, com what comprises the sheath. Uh, for those of you who may be uh, looking on mobile phones, you may not be able to see this well, just get the concept that uh, you've got a, a small, very small tube with fibers underneath the jacket. The separate fiber optic cable would be installed in a separate duct. Now it could be any one of these, as you see in this picture, <coughs> I just plopped it here. So what happens is uh, when this conductor, when the circuit's carrying power, the conductor's gonna heat up and then that heat has to dissipate. But before it gets to this cable, it's gotta go out of the, out of the power cable, through the air, through the uh, conduit, into the concrete, through some more conduit, and then through the jacket of your sensor cable, and then to the fibers themselves. So that heat is being is slowly degrading through that penetration process. It's dissipating. So the temperature I'm going to read here is going to be significantly lower than the temperature I read here. And that's not a good thing if you're really concerned about the reliability of this cable. And there's going to be a significant time lag. It takes time for that uh, heat to penetrate from the cable, uh, from the power cable into the optical fiber cable. And another non-trivial uh, aspect of this is which duct do you put or do you put it somewhere else? I just said I put it here because if I was doing this, this is probably what I would do. And my reasoning would be that heat from uh, this circuit uh, is going to get to here, and then there'll be some heat from this circuit if it's operating also. It's closest to this phase here. If I put it here, okay, but now I'm missing the effect of this. You understand, you're getting a trade-off. What am I really measuring? Now, then you say, well, I could put another cable here too. Yeah, that's true, you could. You could put one in all of these ducts just to monitor everything. Um, but you you understand the concept of the trade-off involved here. You're losing accuracy no matter what you're doing. And you're also uh, uh, putting building in a time delay. So this third way of doing it would be to install a micro cable in with one of the phases. Um, you know, or again, if you wanted to, like I said about installing cable in a separate duct, you could do a micro cable in every duct if you wanted to. Um, again, some loss of accuracy, but an improvement over installing it in a separate duct and a, um, uh, an improvement in reliability, because if for some reason optics fail, you just pull it out and put in a new one. Uh, for some reason, the power cable fails, likewise. Uh, you're not necessarily losing uh, both in one fell swoop. 
And uh, before I move on, though, so A and B are both have both been done all the time. I don't know if anybody who's done this. I work for a cable company. I would love to work with somebody who would like to try this concept because I, I think it's the uh, best of both worlds. OK, moving on, distributed acoustic sensing. So this is based on that Rayleigh scattering that we talked about. You're using very advanced uh, signal processing techniques uh, to uh, uh, detect the uh, acoustic signal. And the only reason I put this stuff in here is because my background is electrical engineering. So things like sw swept wavelength inf interferometry is really sexy to me. So um, there's that. Uh, you can get long ranges from this. Uh, it's been around for more than 10 years, but it's still a very developing technology. Um, it is excellence, excellent for interference monitoring, which means security. So you can detect um, intrusion detection around buildings or substations or anything. Um, in particular, you can detect and classify activities, in particular excavation activity. And that allows you to filter out extraneous alarms. It does require tuning the system. So what I mean by this is you can detect the difference between a guy who's using a shovel to dig near something or a person walking near something versus somebody using a backhoe. And because of this, you can tag team distributed acoustic sensing with distributed ten, uh, temperature sensing. I already talked about this is often being done with high ground underground power cable systems. And the DAS can be added to alert you to make uh, about any potential digging activity because those circuits tend to be critical. And it's dig ins that are a leading cause of damage to all types of underground cable systems, power cables, fiber optic cables, um, you, know, you name it, gas lines, water lines, anything. And the, the saying that's been around for a long time about that is uh, in comparison to aerial cable systems, because people intuitively think that underground systems are going to be more reliable than aerial systems. But that's not always the case. And the reason is there's a lot more backhoes than tornadoes. So continuing with distributed acoustic sensing. So you could also use it for lightning detection. You'll see we've done some testing on that that we'll talk about later in this presentation. So you could use OPGW or ADSS to get location, intensity, and duration data, and then in turn, that can be used by utilities to better allocate resources for inspections, right? Because right now, you would go inspect a line once every year or two or maybe even more, and you send out a guy and he's going to look all along the line. But if you were gathering lightning data, you would know, okay, we had a strike here. Let's go check that area. And uh, that can give you a more efficient use of your uh, inspector's time to be looking for specific problems at specific locations as opposed to just a general inspection. Uh, it's already used for detecting leaks in pipelines. And uh, because of that intrusion detection aspect, you can monitor anything that constitutes a border or a, a sensitive perimeter. Uh, you also see it monitoring, <clears throat> excuse me, for oil and gas and even seismic activity as well. So still developing and yet an already well-developed technology at the same time. So next up, distributed strain sensing and distributed temperature and strain sensing. So DSS and DTSS are closely related. And the reason is that both are using Brion scattering as the underlying concept of how they operate. You can get very long distances uh, using single mode fiber for either of these. There are currently three implementations of this technology. Uh, first up is Brion Optical Time Domain Anal Analyzer, so BOTDA. Um, in this case, you're actually stimulating that Brion scattering effect. 
And you do that by making a fiber loop. So you've got two fibers. Um, they're going from A to B, and then so one fiber A to B, and then a fiber coming back B to A. Uh, and you're injecting light in both directions. And that's the stimulation aspect. So the, you're doing the light in both directions so that you're getting an interaction between uh, the light uh, passing along that fiber against each other. Um, it's kind of like, you know, being on the highway and you see another car coming in the same lane as you, you know, that's bad. But in this case, we can actually use it uh, for better sensing. And so this option is excellent when you're trying to get precision. Um, as a consequence of this, it makes it better suited for laboratory type applications. So research and development, um, or maybe like or maybe like one point uh, application as opposed to a field application, as opposed to a field application along, say, a transmission line. Uh, so it's best for precision. Uh, the next implementation is Brion Optical Time Domain Reflectometer. So there's that OTDR again. So it's a Brion OTDR. You're just using the basic Brion scattering effect. So you only need fiber and you only need access to one end. And this is the option that you use when distance is most important. So when I said back here, you can get very long distances. It's not using this it's using this, this implementation. So the Brion OTDR allows you to go very long distances. There's a third implementation and that's Brion Optical Frequency Domain Analysis, BOFDA. This is a newer technology and what you're trying to do is get the best of both worlds. So you're trying to get uh, the distance of the Brion OTDR with the precision of the Brion uh, optical time domain analyzer. So this is still a new and developing technology. But there are things that you can do with it now uh, that are very useful for electric utilities. You can sort of get one and get the other for free. Um, I need to point that out. Why is that? Well, remember that the Brion scattering will vary with both strain and temperature. So how do you know how much was caused by which uh, effect? Specifically, can you separate the effects of the two? And excuse me one moment. Sorry for that interruption. And the answer is yes, there are two possibilities to separate the two effects, because if they're mixed, then you don't know, well, how much of the change was due to, to the change in temperature and how much was due to the change in strain. Well, uh, today there is Brion OTDR technology available from suppliers that do this separation. Um, it works within a more limited uh, temperature range, uh, but it's available, so you can see one see the effect of just temperature change or just the, the strain change. Or you can use a BOTDA implementation with two fibers, um, one with strain and one without. So uh, one without strain allows you to detect just the temperature change. And if you know the temperature change, you can separate that out uh, from the total change to get just the strain change. And uh, this has been done too. So both of these technologies are available and uh, actually employed already in the field today. Uh, you see a lot of DSS and DTSS on pipeline monitoring it, uh, pipeline monitoring, and it's, it's great for monitoring strain and structures. So it's already been done in bridges and mines and dams. So hydroelectric power plants becomes then an application specific to electric utilities, but utilities have applications for this too. You could use an optical phase conductor. So basically a conductor that's had optics added to it. So a little bit like an OPGW, but added to a conductor. And if you did that, you could sense the temperature 
And from the temperature alone, you could get real time dynamic line ratings. So you could know your actual opacity real time. And I, I think that's huge because today utilities mostly rely upon static line ratings and static line ratings are based upon some assumptions. And tip, those typically are that the ambient temperature is 40 degrees C and the wind speed is two feet per second. So two feet per second is about um, uh, 1.4 miles per hour or for our international listeners, 2.2 kilometers per hour. Well, heck, on today, October 21st, what's the wind speed outside my house in Texas? Beats me, I don't know. Um, but if it's anything above 1.4 miles per hour or 2.2 kilometers per hour, that would have a significant effect on cooling of the conductor. And so if I had rated a line in my area for 1,000 amps, just to pick an, an easy number, well, today, maybe I could actually get 1,100. And that's important for how I operate my power grid to know if I could get more or not. Um, you know, if under today's, you know, in July, for example, when it's 110 degrees out in Texas and, and in the middle of the day, often there's no wind, uh, I might not even be able to get 1,000. I might only be able to get 900, again, safely. Again, important to know. So. If you're using distributed temperature sensing, just that technology is potentially revolutionary because it could tell you exactly how many amps that you, you can keep going. If, you know, if I know uh, right now that the actual amperage is 900, then I know for certain I can go to 1,000 or maybe 1,100. And it doesn't matter what conductor you're using, ACSR or high temperature low sag or uh, type conductor, uh, a, uh, AC, SS, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, you can know exactly how much amperage you can get through that transmission line real time. In addition, you can use the strain sensing aspect for critical structures. So uh, I was at a project some years ago with a customer who had two structures spanning the Mississippi River. So these were very big structures because, you know, Mississippi is um, the mighty Mississippi, big river. Those structures were built in the 1920s. So, you know, you could add uh, D DSS to monitor strain within those structures um, so that you could see anything shifting, anything going wrong, <laughs> fatigue showing up, anything potentially bad going to happen to these structures. So, you know, I think that's potentially revolutionary for utilities to, to be able to know. Uh, at a critical structure or even a representative one, right? You know, utilities have had structures um, cascade failures. Well, you could monitor just one, and from that, you could infer what's going on with others. Of course, I won't complain if you monitor all of them, but I'm just giving you ideas about what you could be doing and how that could help you, as I said earlier, uh, operate your grid more reliably. Next up, distributed pressure sensing, DPS. This is a, a new and fast evolving technology. There are some demonstration projects that have been done. And uh, we here at NCAB expect a lot more in the future. You know, another, it may be another option for lightning detection. As I say here, this is a technology to watch. So I'd like to come back and, and more on this theme of what can electric utilities do. And here's an overview. So uh, by sensing technology and by the type of cable that goes with it and whether you're getting a troubleshooting system, so the system is identifying an emergency location, uh, telling you where exactly you need to go stat to get something fixed or just kind of a warning that's telling you something is about something bad is about to happen and allows you to kind of head that off. So uh, you can already detect uh, short circuit points on a high voltage line. Now, somebody could say, well, the relay and control system can do that too. And I would say, yeah, that's true. Um, but uh, potentially 
uh, with OP, you know, and you can do that with OPGW or OPPC. Uh, but I do believe the accuracy of the OPGW approach would be better. Uh, you could detect lightning strokes. I talked about that already with distributed acoustic sensing and then maybe the DPS, and that could be done with OPGW. Um, I mean, you really could do this with OPPC too. I don't know why I said you couldn't. Um, and you could even potentially do that with ADSS or even a lashed cable. Uh, detection and monitoring of phase conductors, absolutely. You can do that with optical phase conductor. Uh, icing conditions. So um, if, I, if I'm measuring strain in my OPGW, I can infer from this condition what the condition is on my phase conductors too. So that becomes easy. The challenge with OPPC is that when I put a fiber optic unit in the phase conductor, I have to get access to the fiber. And remember, this is energized. So getting access to the fiber requires an optical isolation device of some form, and that becomes a, a complicating factor. So it's not as easy as using an OPGW, which is not energized, you know, except if it's actually hit by lightning or carrying fault current. But in general, it's not energized. So you're able to access that data uh, very easily. And so you could infer it from this and then determine uh, what what's going on on your phase conductors as well. But you could do it with OPPC2 if you wanted to. Uh, control condition, ah, with distributed acoustic sensing on any type of cable, you could be uh, hearing the sounds of an imminent failure on an insulator. Now that does have a complication there. You have to, to have good filtering to filter out a uh, background noise. Um, but in theory, you can do that. Uh, detection of activity, again, uh, we talked about how the uh, DAS technology can be used to monitor a substation or a high voltage underground power line. In those cases, the cable would be buried. But the cable is still sensitive even if it's in the air. So you can use that cable for detecting uh, activity near a transmission line. Uh, again, the challenge is filtering out background noise, uh, but it can be done. Um, and then uh, there are some locations where you monitor the temperature with your OPGW, and when you know, and you can monitor strain on your OPGW, and when ice accumulates past a point that's uh, potentially dangerous, you can then run current, DC current through your OPGW to shed the ice. And then the sensing, first of all, has allowed you to detect that that unsafe condition exists. And then the temperature control allows you to know when you've shed the ice and you can turn off that current, circulating current that you're using to shed the ice. And by the way, that could be done with phase conductors as well. So, and the fact that you could do that with OPPC or OPGW means that you can prevent cascading failures like I talked about before. So uh, to again, elaborate a little bit on these. So detecting lightning, uh, pretty easy. You could detect a strike on the cable itself, but you could also detect a strike that's nearby. Um, if there's a cable failure, then you know, if the lightning hits a cable and it actually causes the cable to mechanically fail, uh, break, uh, then you know uh, from the uh, optics, you can know exactly where that's at. But even if it didn't fail, that record goes back to the concept I talked about earlier of you know where to look for potential damage. Because uh, at least one customer had an instance where the um, the cable got struck by lightning at some point. They didn't know exactly when. And enough of the cable was damaged that um, it was susceptible, it had lost a lot of its strength. 
And then what happened is when winter came and there was ice loading on the cable, the cable failed mechanically. Uh, but the damage had obviously been there for a long time. And so again, this concept of gathering the data will tell you to go look for damage and then you prevent a crisis like that happened, right? Because, uh, you know, nobody likes getting woken up at 2 a.m. because some uh, critical circuit is down because a cable has failed. So you'll know where to look for damage, uh, then you can find it and repair it in a planned manner so that it's not a crisis mode. And I already talked about how you can detect ice loading and then that's gonna be giving you a warning that either the loading is too great, you know, it's, uh, past a point that's safe um, or that you've got potential clearance issues, you know, with cables clashing or too low to the ground such that they're dangerous, uh, very, very helpful and preventative. Uh, I talked about detecting fires. So obviously if there's a fire under the structure, the cables will heat up and, you know, ADSS would heat up quite quickly. But like I said before, you can do fire rated designs so that you know you have a certain amount of time before there's going to be a mechanical failure of the cable. Uh, you could use DAS technology to sense fire in the vicinity, right? Because uh, when fi forest fires are burning, they make sounds uh, that are unique and specific, but th uh, there would have to be work on setting up the filtering of everyday type noise so that you're only detecting the sound of the fire. Likewise, uh, insulator problems have their own unique acoustic signature. The issue that you have there, the challenge is to filter out uh, the other noises so that you're able to detect what is actually a corona discharge or tracking on an insulator uh, that's going to be uh, failing soon. Some, we've done some testing on the lightning uh, detection using DAS. Uh, this is a, just a test band that we set up outside of our factory in Perm. Uh, very uh, typical 50 Coulomb lightning strike. And uh, yeah, it worked. How that looks on the software that's used with these types of sensors is you get a signal uh, before the strike and then during the strike you have something different and that's what's enabling you to separate the two and say that something happened and generate an alarm and then after the event the signal returns to normal over time for some reason when i first saw this it kind of reminded me of the original matrix movie you know when they're looking at the matrix on the screen so this is giving you you can see the matrix uh, we've also done the detecting ice loading. Uh, we had a test span. Again, uh, this is a beautiful summer day in Perm. On our test span, we used weights along the line to simulate ice loading. And uh, we could see that uh, the loading, and by the way, so this was, involved a fiber that was under strain. Um, you know, that, that was incorporated into the design of this particular cable. And that same concept could be used with OPPC or even ADSS. But basically, when the fiber is under strain, you can detect the strain. When the loading goes away, the fiber returns to normal. And so it's excellent for detecting when you've got ice loading. And then consider, like I've talked about before, if you know the load on your OPGW, then you can closely estimate what the load is on your conductors as well. Uh, how that looked when we were doing it. And we've talked about detecting suspicious activity uh, using DAS. Again, the challenge being how do you filter out the background noise? And again, how that might look uh, in the, the software that goes with these systems. And I wanted to talk about a case study that we did. Uh, because as I'm sure you all know that utilities around the world uh, for one reason or another are trying to get more power down their existing rights of way. And one technique that's being used is to replace traditional conductors such as ACSR with uh, 
one of a number of different high temperature, low sag type cable designs. I'm using this as a general term uh, as opposed to any specific uh, uh, design that's high temperature, low sag. And uh, again, just for as background of course, the high temperature, low sag conductors, what you're doing is lowering weight, getting higher strength, and lower thermal expansion. And so what that means is you get less sag at a given temperature than a traditional cable. So the sag at 200 degrees C on ACSR might be this much, but with the HTLS cable, it might be a lot less, you know, on the order of maybe half. And less sags means more amps. And that ampacity increase can be as much as a factor of two. So that's why more and more you see utilities adopting various types of uh, various specific designs that are high temperature, low sag type conductors. But like most things in life, there is a trade-off. Uh, the biggest killer of high temperature, low sag type conductors is the fact that they are tend to be very uh, bend sensitive. Um, you know, they're very strong in tension, but not so good in compression. And so that means when you bend them, they can break. And if they break, then you've lost that strength and therefore you've lost the benefit of the whole design concept. So what causes them to get bent too much? Well, installation is arguably the leading killer of these types of cable was improper installation. So it's very beneficial for a utility to be able to monitor the bending during installation in particular. But in addition, if you're using uh, fiber optic sensing, you can also know the temperature, the strain, any vibration uh, that's going on as well during installation. And so then post installation, you're able to know that the cable was installed correctly and therefore you're actually going to get all of the benefits of the design concept. So uh, the particular type that we did on this project in Belgium, uh, which like the pilot project phase finished up earlier this year, uh, we used a aluminum conductor. So uh, a fully annealed aluminum conductor with a composite single strand core as opposed to a multi-strand core because that worked better for the fiber. Um, we use three fibers because it turns out to detect that bending, three fibers is just right. Two fibers doesn't give you enough, right? Because it's possible for the cable to bend in a, or the core to be bent in a direction that doesn't get picked up. Uh, four fibers is too much. You just don't need that many. Uh, three fibers, it's like Goldilocks and the porridge, just right. And what you see is that the, the sensing unit is attached to the cable reel. And so as the cable is being pulled in, you're able to monitor what's going on. So that's just during installation. And then you probably would say to me, great, Mike, well, what about after installation? I mean, can't I basically turn this into an OPPC? And the answer is yes. The challenge is the accessories. Uh, because of this core, um, the, the nature of this core makes it a challenge to get a dead end that can grip it and you still be able to get the fibers out. That's the biggest challenge of trying to do that. But there are smart people working on that and I expect we're gonna have a solution real darn soon and that would allow monitoring during operation. So we did this as a two year R&D project. This was in conjunction with Alaya, which is the Belgium national grid owner operator and it was done with uh, Wire and Bytes. It's a sister company of us and a De Angeli, uh, I, I don't pronounce Italian correctly, I'm sure, De Angeli Prodotti, uh, an Italian conductor manufacturer. Uh, so that's was successfully completed in April of this year and they're moving on to uh, 3,300 kilometers planned over the next four to five years. So uh, that's a big project. And I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about non-distributed fiber optic sensing. So back to those discrete sensors at the beginning. 
I basically ignored them because, like I said, I'm a cable guy and I just want to talk about cable. So, uh, but there are a lot of possibilities uh, for you. Uh, power transformers, um, or excuse me, there are lots of sensing options that you can use and incorporate into your toolkit for your smart grid at your substations in particular. Uh, so these tend to be the discrete sensors that we talked about before. Uh, but yeah, you can monitor your load tap changer condition, uh, the winding. You can look for hot spots in the winding inside the transformer. Um, you can monitor the oil. Uh, you can listen for the sound of a partial discharge. Um, all kinds of monitoring. Monitoring the cooling controls, because of course those are essential for reliable operation of these transformers you can do all of that there are lots of possibilities and when you can do this you can do also breakers switch gears reactors pretty much anything you want there are a lot of fiber optic sensing options out there that are available today uh, to help you uh, monitor your equipment and as i say with the goal of improving the reliable operation of your utilities grids uh, and then I, I want to touch briefly on how do you put together a system? What, what's going into it? So for utility applications, well, let me back up. Here are the components. So you got the fiber, the packaging of the fiber, which is cable, uh, the sensors, uh, the electronic processing or what generates this the signals of the light source, and then the electronics that are processing that. And then you've got to have some form of a user interface, right, to, to use it with. I showed you example screens earlier in the presentation. And then you've got all the work that went into designing, planning, and installing it. So we'll talk about these components because they're all critical to a system that's going to work well. So first up is the fiber itself. In most utility applications, standard fiber is fine. Um, when you get into things like uh, oil well monitoring, you often need special fibers. And there are a lot of special fibers available here, some of the ones that I know of. But again, for utility applications, standard single mode fiber, you can do a, a host of things with just standard single mode fiber. Likewise, you can do a host with standard utility cables, OPGW, ADSS, whatever, or very minor modifications of it. It's not a big deal. Uh, you know, I talked about putting in a fiber that sends strain. Well, most aerial cables today, like 99% of them, are loose tube construction. And loose tube construction, one of the reasons you use it is that you try to protect the fibers from strain. So that means if you want to measure strain in an aerial cable, you have to now put in a fiber that uh, that uh, uh, is essentially non-loose tube. But that's readily done. That's not something you know particularly hard to do. Uh, but it does make it a little bit special. But as I say, for many applications, just cables you're already using can be used. The sensors, the light sources, and the interrogators, there are companies that do that. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, AP Sensing is one that we work with. They, they do these components, and they do it well. But now, you know, here's something to, to really th reflect on. For all of this to work, you've got to get it designed, and you've got to get it installed. So there's planning that goes into all of that but the design itself and the installation. And so this means that you've got to have a team effort. You got to get everybody involved. Uh, you need, you know, you as the utility need to be involved, but then you need to work with the guys that are doing the fiber, uh, the guys that are doing the cable and who's doing the electronics. And then don't leave out the installer either, because I mentioned with the high temperature, low sag conductors, one of the big, problems with those types of conductors has been the installer not really following the cable manufacturer's recommended installation practices. And then there's trouble and finger pointing and uh, a lot of unpleasantness, shall we say. 
So if you work together as a team and from beginning to end of that process, you can come up with a system that's uh, optimal, you know, good cost, meaning good value for your utility, good functionality, meaning it's going to help enhance the reliability of the operation of your power grid. And of course, that's what you're really going for. So please don't overlook this. It's easy to overlook this, like to just, oh, I'll pick this cable or I'll that fiber or I'll pick this uh, electronic system, but without considering everything as a complete system. And that's likely to lead to some unpleasantness, shall we say. So I appreciate your attention and we'll open it up for questions now. And you can submit questions through either chat or what we're going to try to do is open the microphone. And uh, people can just throw out questions that they have. Let's see, while my uh, colleague is em enabling the microphones for people, I'll just mention one thing. I had talked before about getting continuing education credits. And the way that you do that is everybody will get an email after this presentation will be uh, asking you, uh, did you like the presentation? Please give us feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have ideas for something uh, I didn't talk about that I should have, please let me know. Uh, so please do do take a few minutes and give us some feedback. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The, the survey is a little bit longer than I like, but it's it's what we have to do because of the uh, RCEP. Don't, don't tell them I said that the case um so we would like the feedback uh, you know you don't have to answer all the questions you don't want to just answer the ones you want and give us some feedback but in addition there will be a link in that email where you go and take a test so you have to take a 10 question test you have to pass it with 70 percent and then um we notify rcep that you attended this class and that you passed the test and they give you your your credit hours and because this was a little bit longer than typical uh, you actually get one and a half credit hours for today's uh, webinar. So that's enough. Um, questions? So let me also look for chat. Yep, questions are welcome. Uh, what are the biggest challenging challenge challenges in installing these systems? Okay, well, um, the like I talked about here, uh, you've got to get a system that works together. And I think the hardest part is this. So you've got the electronics and then you've got to match that to a user interface. And that's the challenging part. So the company that you pick to work with on that is really, really critical. There are uh, some good companies, and there are some companies that are more like uh, garage uh, companies. You know, some uh, professor has a good idea and decides to start a company in his garage with a couple of his research assistants. I'm exaggerating maybe, but not by much. Um, so it's important who you pick to work with. And then, as I talked about, everybody's got to work together as a, as a team. Uh, it can be a little bit confusing to pick which box is best, but again, that's why you want to pick a good uh, electronics company to work with on that. Uh, cable design, you've got the typical things that you have with cable design. Uh, you know, you want to pick a, a cable company that's doing, uh, making good cables, good quality cables, and that will tell, tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth when it comes to uh, the trade-offs that are involved in the cable design, because for these systems to work properly, we talked about it, the cable is an important part of the system. So I think that's a very general answer. If you had some more specific question, I'll, I'll try to uh, answer it. And somebody has asked about getting a video, uh, co uh, get a copy of the recorded video. I mentioned that there's a, um, 
you'll get an email asking for feedback and a link for the test. And there's actually going to be another link there where you can get the recorded version of this. And then also, if you go to our website, uh, we have on our website, uh, let me see if I can find that. Uh, hold on just a moment. One moment. Here we go. So, so you go to incabamerica.com. Uh, you find a lot of uh, interesting uh, and useful information here. We've got course information about all of our cable products. And we've got our configurator series, which helps you pick optimal cable for your project. But the thing I wanted to point out now is we have this learning hub where we post these videos. So the, the latest one you can always find here and you, you can find uh, topics that we've done in the past. So this one will be added over the next uh, couple days or so, but you can see the other topics and which the last version of it is the one that's kept current on here. Um, so there's that. Okay. And let's see, what are the, okay, so I had that question. Can an empty blown fiber duct be pulled in along with an underground cable? Yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. Are sensor electronics commercially available for lightning and temperature sensing in underground cables? Uh, for th the temperature sensing for underground cables, absolutely. I mean, that's been done for at least 10 years now that I know of. Uh, for lightning, uh, that's uh, that's newer. So, like I say, we did some testing, so that could be done. Um, we know it can be done, but I don't know of any utility who's actually put it into practice yet. So that again, one of my reasons for doing this webinar today was to get uh, people in our industry to be thinking about this because there's things that we can do that we can all do work together on that will. Uh, improve the reliability of our power grid. And <laughs> part of the reason that's important to me, not just being a good citizen, but recall that I live in Texas. And so I lived through our February uh, ice apocalypse, uh, as it's sometimes being called here in Texas, where uh, we had a blackout for much of the state. So I would like to see improvement in the uh, reliability of power grid, not just in Texas, but everywhere. So I hope I answered that question well. Uh, so that was not a question. Ah, here's a good question. What's the difference between regular ADSS and a fire resistant uh, cable? It says, but I, uh, a regular ADSS will burn quite nicely. Um, if polyethylene ignite, in fact, it's even worse than that. Because if polyethylene ignites, at, and you you would expect it to ignite somewhere in the middle of the span where the sag is lowest, and in any case, wherever it ignites, it's going to propagate the fire. So the cable is going to burn nicely and uh, continue to propagate the fire. And that's a bad thing, obviously. Making You've already got a bad situation, and it's potentially making it worse. So what you do is two things. First of all, you change the outer jacket from polyethylene to something that's a flame retardant. So you can't really make it flame resistance or fireproof. That's more like a metal cable, and even there, you're kind of you know you're kind of limited. You you know we don't like to, in, in today's environment we don't like to think talk about things as being bulletproof. We talk about them being bullet resistant because you know somebody's going to build a barrier bullet or uh, a, a more powerful one or something. So we just say it's resistant. So it's kind of the same thing with that outer jacket material or with any with any cable, even a metal one. You can make it thus and such resistant, but you you can't make it absolutely flame proof. But by making it flame retardant, you stop the propagation. So flame retardant means that if the cable gets uh, ignited, the fire will tend to go out. 
So the fire beneath it has to keep uh, pumping it up to keep the flame even going. So it doesn't spread the fire. So that's one thing you do is change your jacket material. The second thing that you do is you, you protect the optical core. Uh, typically that's with a uh, mica tape or some other of like a, again, a flame resistant type material. And that's what buys you time, right? Because if the fire is hot enough and burns long enough, eventually the cable is going to fail. But you can get um, three hours uh, is what's typical with those cables by making those changes. And again, the, the concept there is at least you don't make the fire worse and you're buying yourself some reaction time. Okay. Any other questions? You you can turn on your microphone and even speak. Okay, I, I'm not hearing anything, so we'll do last call for questions. Okay, uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, time and your attention today, and I appreciate the uh, uh, the questions at the end. Um, you know, you can reach out to me if something occurs to you after the fact. Please also look for the follow up email. And then again, please do give us feedback and you can go to our site and uh, rewatch this and share it with your family and friends even too, if you want. And again, thank you for your participation. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. <laughs>